There's a story inside every smoke shop, with every cigar, and with every person. Come be a part of the cigar lifestyle at Boveda. This is Box Press. Welcome to another episode of Box Press. I'm your host, Rob Gagne, and today I'm at TPE and I'm sitting down with Ian Reith of Dapper Cigar Company. But Dapper Cigar Company, if you know anything about me, has been on my list of top cigars every single year. Why is that? Well, one, they're slowly launching their lineup all the time. Two, it's really good tobacco. And three, it's Ian Reith, Dapper Cigar Company. Why not? Ian, thank Love you it. so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, man. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. This is, uh, this is a lifetime experience here. I'm going to check it off. This has been a long time coming. Has it? Absolutely. I've I feel been like wanting... I haven't earned this chair until You've now. You've earned this chair a long oh. time ago, and I've been wanting to sit down with you and talk to you okay. about your brand journey because it has so many intricate ins and outs, and it truly is a journey of somebody who has no family in the business and literally sure. comes from a consumer's perspective to say, wow, I'd like to try to figure out how to make one of these things. Yeah. One of those things being a cigar. And more importantly, you've had to make a bunch of other things to go along with that cigar to make it a brand that it is today. Well, if the cigars don't work out, we're going to make hats. Yeah, Apparently exactly. Popular, so. The swag is yeah. killer. Yeah. So if you get your hands on Dapper Cigar Swag, I think the line was from one of your articles was, we put as much money as we do into our premium tobacco as our swag because we want people to wear it, not just throw it in the closet and go, ah, oh, that was cool. That is true. That is true. I mean, it's that's about caring about just, you know, what you do as a company, right? You want to make good products. You want to make good cigars. You want to make good hats. Right. Like, you don't want to give a hat. But not everyone thinks of it that way. They think, well, I just got to put swag out there so people wear it. Well, right. if they don't like it, they're not going to wear it. So right. you're, you're one step ahead of the majority. Yeah, uh, maybe, but you know, part of it is uh, as a business, right? You're going to look at swag. A lot of people look at swag as being um, can't believe I'm talking about swag, but yeah, a lot of people look at swag as being a expense, right? It's just something right. you got to do, but you don't spend a lot of time on it and just put stuff out there. But the reality is, you are basically making products just like the products that those are endorsing that you want people to be passionate about and wear because they're essentially advertising your brand for free. So why wouldn't you make great swag? Everybody should make great swag. You made great you swag, and you even Try. made some onesies for my daughter, which I am so thankful for. That's my wife. I didn't make those your myself. Wife. I my think wife, your wife did, uh, and it was uh, our. It was her pleasure to do so. Such a, uh, and such I was a treat. Just, yeah, I was just happy that they came out great. And, so uh, now even my daughter has swag from Dapper <laughs> Cigar Company. It's a whole family thing. It's a generational yeah. thing. We're just going to keep passing it on. It, it is. It is. Uh, I, I don't know if it's legal. I don't know if it's cigar. It's totally legal. Okay. Okay. It's totally legal. I'm going to go with you on you that. You know, I love it. <laughs> Absolutely love it. But more than important, I want to know right off the bat, because I think it's such a cool story, is the whole naming of the company, Dapper Cigar Company. Yeah. You got here that you had a neighbor, Chris, is it Alvarez? Yeah, yeah. He was like an old school barber. Right. No. Yeah, Correct he, he kind of like did that. The old school barber vibe was like his thing, right? He yeah. was he was cutting hair. He had that kind of old school like 1920s look. Yeah, yeah. So he was really hip on like nostalgic, and you're as as well very nostalgic in your brand. So he looked at making it into something that says like now now that's a dapper cigar is what he says to you, and you look at you looked at that and you're like, that's a good cigar name. Yeah, so the, you know, the challenge, you know, step number one, right, if we were to do the uh, steps to start a cigar company, at some point, you have to hit the proverbial, what do we call it? Absolutely. Now, it helps if your last name is Spanish. <laughs> Check that box. No, that wait a minute. Let's, launch you. let's challenge that. It may not help because I don't know how to pronounce it. So I actually think you have an edge because I can pronounce dapper and I know well, exactly what it is. Perhaps it was it was all part of my master genius plan yeah. <laughs> that I think you had with Chris. I was ahead of my time. Out late, smoking a cigar and just shooting the shit. Yeah, we we had a it, you know I, we couldn't figure out what to call it, and um, uh, I couldn't figure out what to call the company. 
I wanted something that was simple. You want something that can resonate with people. Uh, you know, and you, you start thinking of all kinds of stupid things like, you know, if we're going to line up on, a, on an internet search page or if you're going to go to a catalog listing, right. don't you want your company to be kind of close to other big companies? Hint, hint. Uh, you know, in the alphabetical lineup, right? Right. So it's kind of a little bit of marketing. D thing. gets you up there a little high. D gets you there. It's not bad. It's you got some heavy hitters around <laughs> you, you know. And I, I, you know, I used to call people. That's a true story. I used to call people in California. I call retailers. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just calling retailers, just seeing if they're going to even be interested in buying our cigars. And there's a lot of older retailers. Some of them have a little hard of hearing. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. A little hard of hearing. So I would call them and be like, ah, this is Ian Reeve and Dapper Cigars and. They go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I go, yeah, I'm selling cigars. And uh, I'd say, hey, I'm going to be uh, you know, I'm gonna be in your neighborhood. Do you mind if I stop by? Oh, yeah, at 3 o'clock. And I get there. And they look at me and they go, you're not from Davidoff. And I go, <laughs> you're right. I'm not. But now that I'm here, let's see if we can say, <laughs> you know. So it kind of does work. Um, but, yeah, Chris, he lived at that time across from me. And uh, he was just focused on old school barber cuts. Um, and... Man, I had no idea, and he just looked at the cigar. We made that first Kubo band, another yes. generic name, very generic, very easy to say, almost cliche. But he looked at the band, and he said, that's, that's a very dapper-looking cigar. So I go, up oh, there it is. I'm not going to think about it anymore. Done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on. Done. Moving on. So, you know, eight, ten years later, whatever. It's, and how, uh, did, how did the name Kubo come up? Uh, it came with a Cube cigar. It was, a, you know, it was I, I don't know if you remember back about 10 years ago, eight years ago, there weren't a lot of completely box press square cigars. Right. And so in pure gimmicky fashion, I thought, why not make a square cigar? Right. Okay. Drew Estate comes out with a square box press cigar, the Java Mint. Oh, yeah. Like two years later. That so thing I go, is well, very that was square. obviously a, well, it was a dumb idea to begin with. And so we just rolled with it because we had spent enough, I had spent enough money on it that I said, I got to make this work. Dan, our designer, uh, did a really elegant throwback to kind of old school Cuban vibes. And uh, so that's how that happened. So, you know, we started with the C and a D name and both of them very generic. Uh, Kubo is actually one of the few brands out there that have a trademark that are that close to Cuban. It's very oh, rare. Really? Yeah, it's very rare. It's uh, something to uh, you know, kind of proud of that. I don't know. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And you kind of made it up. Kubo. Kind of made it up. It was supposed to be a Cube cigar. You Didn't just, work out. Yeah, you just made up Kubo. Right. Yeah, Put two words Terrible together. idea. Terrible oh, I idea. love it. Yeah. I, it's yeah. great. So there you go. Brilliant. We're off to a good start. We got the name <laughs> of the company. We got a good name to a cigar. Right. We can go to retailers, right. con them into meetings, right. and then sell our cigars. And attempt to sell our cigars. Attempt. Attempt, yeah. It's, that's uh, that's it's, where the rubber hits the road. That's where it gets hard. It's brutal. It it's soul-sucking. <laughs> it's soul sucking. It's soul sucking. Yeah, it's uh, you know I listen to like a lot of these podcasts, and you hear um, all these comedians talk about bombing. Like I'm when you get up there and you just totally fail. Bombing. Bombing. Yeah, like you, you bomb go on stage, you bomb. Yeah, right. You fail. There's booze, etc. Crickets. Crickets. Uh, that is the equivalent of selling cigars on the road. It's that feeling for two, three years. It's why you, do they bomb it? Why do well, why do the retailers just say nope? It's tough, and it depends on your area, too. So I started selling cigars in Northern California. Northern California is a brutal territory to start selling cigars. California is a tough state to start selling cigars. Uh, and when you don't know anything about selling cigars, it increases your uh, chances of bombing every time. Yeah, you know, learning curve is probably steep there. It's, 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 it's brutal. <laughs> it's soul-sucking and brutal. It's, we'll get into that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But first, I want to know, how did you even get your idea or concept for the business? Like, what made you say, hey, I'm going to try opening up my own cigar line? Uh, naivety. You know, you just, you just go one step at a time, and you just try to con your mind into saying, all right, next, next thing we got to do is this, and next thing we got to do is this, and you just keep plugging away. And it helps to be... Uh, very naive about a lot of things, I think, right? Absolutely. So, uh, the, if I knew how soul-sucking selling cigars on the road would be, I would have never done it, right? It loses its luster, the passion behind it. It's like, whoa, this is totally different than smoking cigars. 
all of it, right, in the business. If you think about, if you knew all the inside baseball stuff and you knew how challenging it was to establish a new brand in cigars, with all that's happened in the last 10 years, any, like, semi-intelligent person would not do it. Right. So you have to be really naive in order to keep plugging away and keep doing what we did, you know. But so you're a consumer. Yeah. And you're thinking, like you've always said, you just, it was like a hobby that just exploded for you. You were like yeah. immediately into it. You wanted to know more about it. Right. And that fueled your desire to say, let's see if I know how to make one of these. And that's really how you set out. It was like, I just want to see if I can make one. Yeah. I mean, that's really it. And you start from scratch on everything. You start from scratch learning how to find who to work with. Where do I buy tobacco from? What factory do I make cigars with? How do I print bands? Where do I print bands? You know, what do I have to have to sell this cigar? What, do, what kind of, you know, do I got to register anything? Do I got to pay any taxes on that? I mean, all of right. this stuff is like um, you're finding everything out for the first time. Yeah. And so there was no one there to lead you through the gauntlet. No, no, there was no uh, cigar companies for dummies book, which I will be uh, producing later in my career. That would be great. A the cigars Z. for dummies book would we're be gonna, awesome. We're going to sell it right in the entrance. Absolutely. At the trade shows. It'd be good. Trademark. That's trademarked. But, you know, yeah. we'll we'll figure it out. You know, Miami Herald bestseller. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Piece of cake. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, but. I feel like I got that. I got a lot of that, those lessons, and you know, when you meet other cigar makers, you you so share you were, a lot of things. You were getting educated through other cigar makers telling you, like, "Oh, hey, here, try this or do this or yeah." Here's how you, you get through that hurdle. It's such a small business, you know. It, so how did you meet them, though? It started by basically going to retailers. The retailers that I were uh, visiting became friends with them. I would talk to reps. Uh, interesting story the kubo band you know we print those brand, uh the bands we print all of our bands at a company named fry dog in holland uh that's the premier band company they are they are one of the premier printers in the world for bands a hell of a company i mean they sold uh paint to van gogh i think i mean you know. oh my gosh they yeah. sold paint to van gogh yeah, that's i that's in their these literature. guys are artists these guys are no joke so uh, I would have never been able to print those bands had I not met Nelson Alfonso at a cigar event in Fresno, California. And um, I, sh I literally showed him my artwork on the cigar uh, that I cut out, like paper. Like I printed it on my, you know, inkjet or laser, and I cut it out. And I was like, yeah, and we got to talking, and the guy was so nice. And I had actually tried to contact them a year prior, and they were like, yeah, we don't really have any room. Right. For guys looking to print. <laughs> we don't like, have any room for some. Yeah. Who, they, they, who's this? They asked me, like, how many bands did you want to print? I'm like, I don't know, a thousand? <laughs> and it was, we it don't was even crickets. fire the machine up for that. You're right. It was crickets, right? Yeah, I don't know. And uh, so I told him the sto whole story and, and whatnot. And uh, he looked at me. It's true, sir. He looked at me. He goes, you have to do this. You have to print this, and you got to print this as Vry Dog. Why? He just, I don't know. Just Because of the artwork? Just, no, I just loved what I was doing with it. It was very intricate. It reminded he's European, so a lot of that old school kind of look. Not a lot of companies are doing bands of that kind of intricacy. Yeah, because you anymore. got like some old buildings in there. It's got a yeah, very, it's very intricate, it's yeah. beautiful scenery of, uh, of sunset a vista. in the background. Yeah, and there's a steeple kind of deal in there from a, a famous Cuban city. And this is the Kubo cigar band Correct. that we're talking about. Correct. The and, first cigar. Um, no, he said uh, you have to print it. You have to print it. You, you have, have to, to print it at right. Yeah, it's, you it's, have to print it. It's gone from yeah. Eh, um, no, we're printing this. Well, when somebody's uh, power suggestion, right? Yeah. When exactly. Nelson and Alfonso and Nelson's uh, company is Golden Age Empires, he prints and does all the production for Cuban, so all the Habanos SA bands, all that stuff. He also has designed all the Atabay and Byron cigars, those high end cigars that you see in the U.S. Uh, he's the designer of all of those. They're all printed, I think, I believe, at Rydog. And th he told me, you have to print these, and you're going to use our rep, and I'm going to send a note to him. And now so you got an in. Yeah, I had to print 100,000, but, you know. Green light. Yeah, 100,000 was a little rough when I heard 100, that. 100,000? It bears a small number, but when I heard it, I, I nearly shit myself. Oh, my gosh. I was like, dude, we got to sell 100,000 cigars 100,000 <laughs> cigars? You went yeah. from 1,000 to 100,000 in the click of a button. Bands. Just the bands. So. And just the bands. Yeah. But 
anyways, uh, you that, still got those bands. You have you ever mm-hmm. had to reorder Kubo bands? Uh, we ordered a lot of different bands. Yeah, yeah, we, okay. yeah, we went, yeah, we went through them. <laughs> How long did it take you to go through the thousand? Long time. Thousand? I think we just got through them last year of that okay. specific line. And you've yeah. been out since what year? <sighs> Who knows? I'm not very good with dates, but it's got to be at least six years on the market. Six Five years. years on the market. It's tough going. That is tough, tough going. going. Yeah. The but road, that's one line. You the know? road is not easy. The road's not easy. Yeah, and I mean, we really haven't seen, you know, the last couple years have really been exponential for us. The first, you know, the first few years, if you look at those charts, it's like a slow ramp. Right. And then it kind of starts curving up really high. What do you so. think makes customers engage with your brand more now? Is it the exposure you've gotten through other medias? All of it, yeah. Guys like you. I mean, um, people like you play a tremendous role. Um, we don't do any advertising. Um, you know, it's it's a company for No philosophy. advertising other than your swag. Yeah, that's it. No so no print. No. No online because you really can't do it anyways. No. Well, you could on some of the cigar media sites. Yeah, yeah. But it's expensive. It's expensive. Yeah. And what no about magazines, lo- no well, local, sites. you have neon signs for retailers. We have retailer signs, yeah. So we're talking about like very rudimentary advertising. Yeah, everything like, that we do is made from us. Did you ever take out a phone book ad? No. <laughs> Thought about it. In Miami. In no. Miami. No, Dapper ranks high. Yeah. Put a triple A in front of it, and we're golden. Yeah, yellow pages. Yeah, right yeah. next to the uh, attorney. You know, <laughs> the guy, that, the accident attorney. Yeah. The darn it, yeah. attorney. No, we haven't done. You know, we haven't done it because one, uh, it's expensive. Yeah. And two, we actually don't feel like a customer you gain from an advertisement is as meaningful as a customer that you gain because they bought your cigar, they loved your cigar, or they loved something about what your cigar company is, whether it's a story, whether it's a referral from a friend, any right. of these things that resonate, whether it's somebody saw a hat. We got, well, you know, one time we got a, uh, an email from somebody and said, I was flying in a plane and I saw this hat and I loved it. Can you guys sell us this hat directly? And at that time, we weren't selling the hats. And we said, no, but, you know, we'll see if we can find one for you. But the person didn't even like cigars. They just saw the hat on a plane. Isn't that cool? Pretty cool. That says a lot about the styling of your brands. We've done well with that. Uh, Our designer, uh, Dan Greta, is just, he's a rock star. He's he's world class, and we're just happy to have him uh, on the team. That's, That's unbelievable. Were there moments, especially in the beginning, where you thought, this is going to fail? I'm, I'm out. I, I, thought can't. That, I thought that way this morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. You know, this morning I thought about throwing in the towel. You, you think about it all the time. The, really? Yeah, you ha- yeah, because the cigar business is so brutal. It's, you know, from a manufacturing standpoint, it's just getting good news in the cigar business, when you get it, you almost don't even know if it's real. That's how infrequent it is. Whether it's legislation, whether it's uh, you know FDA stuff, whether it's production problems, whether I mean even when coronavirus came out, when I, I would say about March of last year when it first came out, and it literally felt like the world was coming to a standstill. You have a respiratory disease. It's March, and what are all the retailers going to do? They're not going to order any cigars. Right. They're going to sell what they got in their inventory because they don't know if they're going to be around. And when you sit there for a couple weeks and you see a trickle of orders, you go, dude, is it over? You know? And that little experience is like everything. You know, when the FDA decides, hey, we're going to ban this or we're not going to allow this or... You're always constantly going, oh, my God, is this really the right decision? Is this really the, the right business to be in? So, you know, it's, 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 it's a constant thing in the cigar business. You have to really love to make cigars in order to be in the cigar business on a long term. And I think that's why you see a lot of cigar companies that are small come in and they leave after a couple of years because they just haven't. There's just too many of those bad news moments. How right? did you convince retailers that you weren't a flash in the pan and you were going to be around for a while? Because, I mean, it's one thing to say you got the passion to do it, but I'm sure retailers like, yeah, I've heard that from the other six guys that left. 
So we still, with, we still deal with that today. And the only way that we can convince them is by coming to trade shows every year and consistently really? putting out new product and consistently showing that we're in here. We're in it to win it kind of thing, you know? Right. There's no other way. Because we can, I could, you know, a lot of retailers would come to me at a trade show and go, well, you know, we don't know if you're going to be around next year kind of thing. And, you know, in the back of my head, I'm like, well, me neither. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> hey, jumps on you, buddy. No. Uh, but that is the reality, right? The reality of it is, is that the only way that you can convince retailers to buy in that are skeptical of that is that you show up year in, year out, and you keep releasing new cigars, and you keep growing little by little by little by little. That's the only way I know. Right. I don't know of the other paths. I just know the path that I've gone through, and I know that from my experience, these things have kind of worked, and the more tenacity and the more, you know, you start to develop, you start to harden a little bit, right? It's like everything. I think every business and every venture is probably very similar to that. Yeah, there's definitely a need to keep it going yeah. internally yeah. and then externally. So to me, that means for you, there's probably sacrifices that you've made. What are those sacrifices that you can list that you're like, yeah, I definitely made that sacrifice to keep the brand going? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's there's every sort of sacrifice that you could possibly have. I mean, um, financially very difficult, you know, and let's face it, uh, finances is what you gotta, you gotta be well capitalized. If you want to go into cigar business, you have to be able to generate, you have to have money. You have to be able to keep up inventory. You have to put money into the company and know that you're not going to see that for a while. And was there uh, ever time you looked at the bank account and said, I just don't have the money to do it. You mean other than this morning? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, there are lots of times when you look at what's going on and on the manufacturing side um, on the manufacturing and company side our margins are very slim you know I'm not going to speak for everybody uh, I mean I know what we do and I know kind of in general what the market's like but you know you have to run a very tight ship I think uh, and um, and you have to be prudent with the money I mean hence the you know is it a good idea to spend five thousand dollars to advertise on something yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's tough. Right. Uh, and when you're building products, too, you know, if you're printing bands that are super high quality, if you're making boxes that are super high quality, you are choosing to invest a lot of money up front into those things with the hopes that they will pay off because you really don't know. Right. You know, so there's your... Because you, you can have a, lot a of very fancy look and high quality feel, but if people right. don't smoke it, mm -hmm. you're not going to get the return on your investment. Yeah. And, and even when you do have the cigars out, you know, you blend these cigars, you make this packaging, you do, you invest a lot of money up front, but what's the guarantee that that product is going to resonate with consumers? Right. You know, uh, I'll give you an example, you know, the Kubo brand that we started originally, our other brands have done, uh, have done very well and compared to Kubo. The first one. The Kubo, Claro, and Maduro, we weren't able to really move it after we were selling El Baracho and La Madrina and Siempre. Really? Every, yeah, everybody was buying these other my brands. God, that for Kubo whatever reasons. Claro is my favorite. Well, there you go. For whatever reasons, right? So uh, what ended up happening, and this is kind of like ego, is I decided, well, obviously... We need to redo that brand, right? Because the brand's right. awesome. I mean, yeah. we don't love the brand. Yeah, hey. brand's awesome. So we went through insanity developing the Kubo Sumatra. The backdrop is insane. It's Cuban village. It's like, if you look at the backdrop, it's insanity. It's Star insanity. Work. It's insanity. Star and work. it's a great cigar. Right. But at the end of the day, it still does not sell as well as La Madrina and El Baracho, et cetera. So... You know, I don't think about it too much. And my current opinion is that you have to have, like, enough uh, humility to be able to say that sometimes when we do these risks and we make these brands, they, won't, they don't resonate. And sure. you got to put that guy to bed. 
and you got to move on to the ones that do resonate. And so that's what we're getting better at doing in the last couple of years is we're saying, hey, look, we're not going to beat this dead horse, right? Right. Uh, and we're going to move on. We're going to keep progressing. So I don't even know if I answered your question. I you totally did. Question. Yeah, uh, you totally did. I think it's really interesting that cigars are one of those unique things that it's like kind of like coffee. What's in it matters. Right. And how it's been treated really, really matters. Right. From the fermentation process. Um, you had said your hope is that uh, customers become more educated about what goes into the cigar to really judge it as far as its quality. Yeah. Um, but what do you think the consumer needs more education on? Because that's a hard spot to be in because... Well, limitations on what you can disclose and what you can't right. through FDA and whatnot. Right. And then two, I don't know what you paid per right. pound to make this. Right. I don't know your profit margin. Right. I don't know if I'm getting a good deal. I just know when right. I smoke it, I like it. So what else right. do I need to know? Yeah, I mean, uh, what frustrates me about the cigar business, and to this day, I think we do a very bad job in the cigar industry as a whole. Uh, I look at uh, wine, for instance, and with wine, there's a remarkable uh, descriptive and detailed, uh, just every product that you see coming out, you know, Napa wine, European wine, there's such transparency when it comes to the ingredients. Sure. They, they don't even, I mean, they'll tell you not only the country, they'll tell you the species, they'll tell you the hill. It's grown up. They'll tell you that a lot in the hill, in the right. appellant, in the, you know, because they're very proud of it. And two. It matters. It matters. Right. And I think it does matter. And one of the things uh, I would like to see personally, and you know, it's going to take a bit to get there, is to be that descriptive so that consumers know when they're smoking that cigar this is why the cigar tastes like this. Can this you, is why I like that. I got a suggestion then because mm -hmm. I interviewed the guy you buy tobacco from, John Oliva yeah. Jr. Yeah. And John taught me that you can plant tobacco on the left side of the road and it comes out peppery and in the exact same, almost same spot, 40, 40 foot difference because the road separates the two plots, on the right side of the road, comes out more sweet exact right. same seed exact same varietal it right. all matters on where it's planted right so as the blender right can you give me some tasting notes on hey i planted this seed varietal because i wanted the sweetness to come out of it and i planted it over here because it brought that right right i think that would be helpful because to me then now you're getting down like wine territory you're getting into terroir why does it matter why you chose this field right and why you picked these ingredients right but a lot of people in the industry shy away from telling me what flavors i should be tasting are you right. afraid of telling people what flavors they should be tasting no no i mean uh we try to disclose you know we're probably one of the fewer companies that you, know, you can go to our website and any tobacco that we can disclose we'll disclose it We'll tell you what the binder, wrapper, filler components are. And if we can disclose the farms, we'll disclose the farms. Uh, if we can, if it's available. If it's not, you know, it's because of various limitations with brand conflicts, et cetera. Uh, but uh, I want to be 100% transparent about it because I'm very proud of it. And I would love to convince uh, others in the farming uh, aspects of it. Uh, you know, I'd love to sit down and, and uh, talk with John about getting real deep and providing lots of information because they have such a hard job growing that tobacco. Yeah. And we're also talking about a product that changes year to year. And that's something that the wine industry is very good at. If you have, you know, more rain in one year and it affects the crop, they vintage very well in wine. We don't vintage at all in cigars. We really don't. Should we be? I think we should. Why shouldn't we? Because... If but somebody says, hey, I, I tried an El Baracho, I tried your San Andreas one uh, five years ago, eh, didn't really like it. 
Well, is that the same El Baracho that you're going to try five years later? Shouldn't be. But what about the consistency that you're trying to provide through a, a blend? So I, from right. what my understanding is, is like, okay, if the blend has changed because of the climate or because of the terroir, now I need to re-slightly alter the blend to come back to my home base right. of where I started this blend in the first place. Right. And Are there's you only playing so much that? you could do. Yeah, but there's only you're trying to get the high level. Okay, so you're right. you're saying there's limitations there and you might swing Absolutely. based off of vintage. Absolutely. And and what vintaging would allow you to do is it would allow you to explain the differences, the slight differences. And it would also help uh, us as manufacturers and retailers because if you have particularly great vintages, people will buy those and seek those out. Uh, but then what if you don't? You're stuck. If you don't, yeah, that's bad. It's bad news bears. Yeah, bad news bears. But, hey, you know, we'll roll with it. <laughs> Got to have some bad vintages, you know. Dom Perignon's not great every year. Yeah, right. I see that at Costco. You telling me that's the best one? <laughs> No way. Costco got the 2009 vintage. Yeah, the 2009, right? And you take it over to your friend's house. He's like, oh, 2009. That's not good. That's so good. That's not good. good. But 2008, <laughs> that's money. <laughs> hey, I don't mind our cigars being that way. Yeah, we really? you got to shoot for great vintages every year. All you know? right. And you like if, the pressure. And look, we'll just do like the cigar industry. If it goes really weird, we'll just have them reprint the good vintage bands. Oh, okay. Did I just say that? So no. just slap a, <laughs> slap a sticker yeah, on it. We need more 2008s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You're building a lot of trust with our uh, clientele now. That's a terrible joke, but we joke about those kind of things in the cigar business because there is so many outlandish things that can be seen. You well, know? and you're I mean, kind of pointing out that there's a lot of opportunity to not really be guided right. by a set of strict rules. Right. I right. would say the wine industry is pretty heavily regulated. Very much so. And, you know, when you look at even places like France where they grow, uh, like, champagne, uh, or they don't grow champagne, but where champagne comes from, or you look at, like, you know, I, I drink a lot of Italian red wine, Brunellos and stuff. Oh, my gosh. These, the control that the farmers and producers have to have in order to uh, call themselves those categories of wine, it's pretty regulated. It's, you right. know, for the good thing, because when right. you pick up that product at the store, you know that there's a certain level of commitment and, and process to that. Yeah, you, you know? want it to taste the way it's been reviewed. Right. You know, you spend $75 on that bottle of Celebration wine, you should get yeah. the same review in Wine Spectator or whatever that, right. that bottle got. Or if you buy a bottle of champagne and they made it with, you know, different grape. Well, right. Uh, that would be a little weird, you know, right. but, so, uh, yeah. So you've also talked about, especially in the beginning of starting your brand, you were really trying to stay in tune with what the customer was wanting. Mm -hmm. That led you a little bit away from your true North Star, your true, hey, I know what this could develop into and what this brand could be. When do you think you need to listen to the customer and when do you think you need to shut it off and listen to your intuition and your yeah. brand awareness? Man, good question. Um, real good question because uh, when you get on the road or you're in the cigar business, you get a lot of input. There's no lack of input. Everybody's going to tell you what you should be doing. The shirt that says, I smoke cigars and know things? Yeah. That just means I like to give you my opinion. Correct. <laughs> and I've heard a lot of opinions. We don't make enough Lanceros. We don't make enough Candelas. We don't. Yeah. Um, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, my current position on it is that I try to think about what I would like and what other people would like. And if it's sellable, then we see if it sticks. Okay. We make the product. We blend it to what I think is going on. You know, if, if the market is tending to be heavier and we don't have a heavier cigar, then we need to make a heavier cigar. And then I combine that with the data because now we have the sales data. So we've been around a little bit enough to now know, okay, well, what is a, when we sell a new brand, how does that look? Right. If it's going to be a good one and it's resonating, what does the pattern look like? Right. And it turns out that it's pretty predictable because when you make a good cigar, people will reorder that good cigar. Oh, yeah. And when the brand resonates, 
They'll order more. They'll continually order more cigars of that cigar. You'll get a lot of uh, new customers come in to ask you about that cigar that maybe you know you didn't previously uh, experience. Um, so there are some indicators. See, it's a combination of like intuition and just data. You know, yeah. and you have to be humble enough to say, look, if this thing doesn't work, we are not going to try to make it work. Like we're not going to shove this round. Right. Or square peg into the round hole yeah, yeah, because yeah. we love the brand and think that, look, the consumers decide. At the end of the day, when they go and they buy those cigars, that's the vote. And whatever they buy, the, the, the ones they buy the most, those exactly. are the ones that win. What are some of the best suggestions you've received during the buildup of Dapper Cigar Company? Mm. You know, um, I have a pretty small sphere of people um, that I talk to about the business and about the cigar experience. It just just because just I'm not out a lot amongst the community. I'm not doing a lot of trade shows and stuff, and I just my nature. Uh, but I take a lot of advice from a guy named Gustavo Cura. He's a, a mentor of mine with Oliva Tobacco, and he runs know, the factory down there. He, yeah, he is overseeing Noxa and Oliva Tobacco's uh, uh, Prosa Nixa, their fermenting and sorting operations in, sure. in Nicaragua. He's been a very, very good personal friend of mine, and he gives me a lot of great advice. And his advice is not only from him, but it's from advice given to him. Sure. Because he was very good friends with guys like Frank Anessa and the Olivas, of course. And, you know... You know, a a simple, great piece of advice that he gave me was Frank Anessa. Uh, Frank Anessa told him that you knew a cigar was good when the guy was smoking the cigar and he was halfway through the cigar and he would, you know, reach over in his pocket just to check to see if he had another cigar. (laughs) Because that's how you knew that that cigar was good. I got to make sure I have another one of these. Yeah, you, that's that's why we got to have the pocket, right? So, uh, so advice like that. Um, lots of guys throughout, you know, this last eight years have given me little tidbits like that that you kind of put in the memory banks. But that one really sticks out. Um, it's good. Yeah. So you're really listening to the customer's reaction, yeah. but you're still honing in on. Yeah your North Star of this is what I want to do, this is what I want to blend. And especially, that's where you're getting all that from Noxa. Right. And from other people as well, because you've worked with other blenders outside of Noxa. Yeah, I mean, uh, right now our concentration is Noxa. Uh, in the past, I've worked with a gentleman named Gonzalo Puentes, and we've, we blended the uh, Cuba Claro and the Maduro, the originals. And, uh, you know, I mean, right now I work with Noxa, uh, and Raul Diesel a lot. Raul Diesel is the uh, production manager there. And working with Raul is very, um, it's very productive because there are some people in life, you know, when you work with them they're, uh, and their experience, if they've gone through something 20 and 30 years and they've yeah. been in something, generally they will have formed very strong opinions about their preferences. Don't use this tobacco. Now, when they tell you don't use this tobacco, is it because they don't like tobacco? Right. Or, and that's what happens. Raul, remarkably, is the most open-minded person about blending that I've ever worked with for somebody so long in the industry. And we'll sit there and get in downright, you know, kind of arguments a little bit. <laughs> no more Omatepe. No. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's very productive. And he always tells me, he's like, look, these are your cigars. So you have to be happy with these cigars. And that's rare because to have that kind of working relationship, at the end of the day, I'm not down there in the production facility day in and day out like Raul is. Right. You know? And uh, it's very important that we have that relationship. And he is able to look at all of our blends with, you know, virgin eyes. Sure. That's hard to do because you get, even myself, you get, you get hardened and you get set in your beliefs and you go, oh, I'm not going to do that because 
of my prior experiences. But then to look at everything new and say, I think this can be improved or I think we should revisit this or I'm open to using this tobacco. I'm open to doing it this way. That's been a lot of our success in the blending category, I think. That's awesome. Yeah. Good suggestions feed new creativity. Yeah. Yeah. Gus is like that too. He's always looking at improving things. He's never content. It's always what can we do better. Right. And that's hard because cigars are also traditional. So you're battling innovation and tradition. Yeah. You know? Your brand is very traditional as far as you're pulling from the roots that have already been there, but you're really amplifying that in your brand. When you're looking at naming a cigar line, you've said like El Bracho came from, now I might, what are the cards that your your wife, they're like these Hispanic cards. Yeah, Lolo Teria. Lolo Teria. They're bingo cards. It's like a Mexican bingo game. I think it might even be Spanish bingo game. Okay. Yeah, very popular in, uh, in Mexican and Hispanic cultures. And uh, they're great cards. Uh, the, the artwork is great. And the, the, the names are great. Matter of fact, there are some other cigar brands out there that have names similar to the bingo cards. But El Baracho came from that bingo card, came from my wife. And uh, it was a great call. This is a tremendously successful brand. People like drunks, apparently. It's, it's, a, good, <laughs> it's a good play. But the whole idea was like you're, you're calling it the drunkard. Right. Right? Right. But where did that that name come from? Why did you even decide well, to go I was down drinking there? a little bit too. I think she, <laughs> I, I think the power of suggestion uh, was involved there. And uh, was it a card that you saw and you're like, "That's a cool logo." Yeah, the card, if you ever see it, is a is a drunk guy with the bottle, you know, yeah, tipping it away. And uh, yeah, it, 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 to me, we took that and then we made it, we cigarified it. Sure. You know, we, we turned it into a cigar brand like we would want. And uh, uh, Nel, it was funny, Nelson Alfonso actually came to me uh, several, you know, after we released it at the trade show. And uh, he looked at it and he's like, this is very nice, but you should have called it Las Barachas. I'm like, huh? I'm what like, does that Nelson, mean? Nelson, we just, uh, female drunkards. Female drunkards? The female drunkards versus the male drunkard. Okay. So I was like, uh, Nelson, we already printed everything, bro. We, there's, right. there's no redos here. <laughs> like, we already invested all this. We, we can't. No. But thank you. I appreciate that. No, he's meaning in a very uh, nice way. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, all of the brands. We take these concepts. We try to make it relatable. We try to make it simple. We try to make it resonate with consumers in some way. What do you think, though? So as far as, like, a consumer... For me to know a little bit about El Baracho, the story behind how you even decided to name it, then the artwork goes together. Yeah. The whole thing as far as maybe even the blend is supposed to be palatable for the everyday smoker. What how do you make sure, especially with no advertising budget, how do you make sure you get that message out to the consumer? And what do you think makes the consumer connect to that? Yeah, that's tough, man. That's uh, If I had the answer to that one, boy, oh, boy. But you're trying to do some of these things to connect that message because you say that it's right. important to tell that story so that the consumer gets connected to it, right? Right. You know, as an example, El Baracho, there's a lot of Spanish-speaking uh, people in the United States today. California, I mean, where I live, uh, heavy Spanish influence, maybe 50% Mexican. L.A., right. you're looking at the same situation. Uh, Texas, you're looking a lot. Of, there's a very large Hispanic uh, movement in the U.S. That brand connects very well off the shelf because it's a Lolo Teria card as well. And it's almost like a sense of joy when somebody sees that brand. And that brand is one of our few brands where people will just stumble on it. You don't get that opportunity. Kind of like a the lot. El Baracho. You don't. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Stumbling around. Yeah, yeah, I like that. That's good. Uh, yeah, you don't get that often. Now, we've tricked them, or we've created this imagery and this name enough for them to spend ten or twelve bucks for the cigar. Now the cigar's got to be good. Right now, the cigar's got to live up to it. And it, correct and 
what if we made that that cigar, you know, full, full, full? Well, how many people in the market are smoking super full cigars? And all those people that bought that cigar because they resonated with the name. Can no longer smoke it. They're not going to smoke it, right? They're going to be like, oh, my God, I tried it. It just made me throw up. So the story does but matter. Sto- story does matter, and everything, I think, has to align. I mean, if align. they threw up with El Baracho as the name, I would say there's still a connection we could infer there. But, you know, yeah. We, we, we don't we're going to make that. that cigar. Yeah, right, right, It'll be right, the hangover. Right, right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you have to, in that particular sense, like, things have to align. you got to make a medium-bodied cigar, I think, because if a guy gets that cigar. I mean, we get so many stories of women coming in to buy cigars for their husband. And what do they pick? They pick that one. Because it gets a little chuckle. You know, they go, oh, you know, perfect. Cinco de Mayo. This fits my Crush husband. Crush it on Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> oh, it's like, it's, you know, everybody, everybody's at St. Patty's Day cigar or right. a Halloween cigar. We're Cinco de Mayo. We got there Cinco de Mayo locked down. There um, you go. La Madrina, same way, resonates with a lot of people because it's a very... I don't want to say gothic-looking brand, but it is. It's a very, very uh, Renaissance kind of medieval-looking thing. It has a thing. skeleton arm holding a rose. Right. Why right. did? Right. What's the story behind naming it La Madrina? What right. does it mean? Why the skeleton and the rose? Well, you know, we wanted to go in with the. You know, we're in California. We're very heavily influenced by Mexican culture in California. Uh, my wife is Mexican. Uh, it, Day of the Dead is a it's a real interesting holiday, right? And guys like uh, John Huber, for instance, at Crown Dead did a great job with that Lots Calavars, amazing, amazing cigar and branding. I thought, right? And I just wanted to make a cigar that was themed around the Day of the Dead, and but then you run into really weird issues. Because you're selling cigars, but then are you going to be promoting death? Like, it's kind of like, uh, yeah. it's a weird one. It's like, you know, you don't, it's a real fine line. It's for all us funeral directors out there. Re- exactly. <laughs> exactly. We got you. Still uh, hold my license. So I'll smoke it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we had to come up with a theme and a look that illustrated more of the beauty of death, per se. And the gist of kind of the holiday and what that remembrance of the dead kind of holiday means and enca- and capture that in a brand. And that's where a guy like Dan, you know, he's best in the world. He creates these things by graphically representing them really beautiful. And the hand in the rose uh, is very iconic. We get It's our most popular cigar, uh, and everybody loves that logo. Is that a fuller-bodied cigar? It is a fuller-bodied cigar. And it's it your most popular body. cigar. Is yeah, it's our most popular cigar. Yeah, so maybe, both in the U.S. and the uh, maybe, U.S. and overseas. Maybe a lot of people are smoking fuller-bodied cigars. They are, they are. Uh, but uh, that particular cigar, we kind of don't feel like we have to apologize if somebody gets a little nicotine buzz. It's because really well balanced. You know, it does have a skull hand on it, so it's like we did warn yeah, you. Yeah, right, right, right. You know, it's not like you know. So it wasn't a. Sunshine and roses? No, no, that's it. Cuba. Does have a rose on it? Yeah, it does have a rose. But it, you know, we we get so many, uh, and you know that r- remarkably also that cigar resonates very well with uh, with women as well. Strangely enough, a lot of women love that cigar. We Why do you think they connect with it? The artwork, it's the rose. I think the artwork. Really? Yeah, yeah I think it's the artwork. So uh, we'll be announcing some uh, some new things with that brand to expand it in the future. You always said like a large goal of yours was to personally dedicate some time, maybe commitment on the education front. You had kind of dropped a hint in one of your interviews. You're saying, I won't go into specifics, but I'm working on a way to integrate all of my stories, my learnings, and my experiences in this industry to really dive deep and get consumers involved with all the very specific parts that go into making a cigar. Yeah, we failed on that. We haven't done that well yet. But it You is failed on it? Well, I had a grand duo's dream that it would be further than what we've done. Um, I wanted to really, really 
take people into every aspect of cigar making. Uh, it was, uh, it's kind of a bit of a expensive project that I've shelved a little bit because of the amount of resources it would take to do some of the things that I wanted to do. And I think also my problem is I want to do it in a very high quality. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, it's still, that's at the forefront of the company. Like everything that we do, we try to be educational about it. We just don't go in, you know, if we do an event, we just don't go in an event and just say, hey, look, yeah, it's Nick Rogg and this and whatever. And woodsy, chocolatey, enjoy. Right. You know, we try to tell the story about the cigar. We try to exp- experience, explain the experience of the cigar because we think that it, that matters, right. you know, uh, in the cigar business at least. Um, so that's what we try to do. And we want to do much more. Um, yeah, in the future. Still working on it. Perfect. Still getting there. What do you think makes it so expensive to do, though? I'm trying to rack my brain when you said that. I'm Production like, costs, you know, um, and doing it of high quality, you know. I mean, like, you know, you guys, the setup here is very <laughs> nice. The grade A production costs. I feel like, you know, we could shoot, like, uh, we could shoot a short film. With the stuff sure. here. This is, yeah, it's great stuff. We but, got the talent. Yeah, exactly. So, shout out um, to Steve. It, it's, shout out to Steve, man. This is an uh, incredible setup here. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, to produce these kind of things. And also, there's a lot of uh, transportation involved, right? I mean, because in the States here, we're on the sales side of it. But really, where all the magic happens is out there in Ecuador, out there in the fields, out there in. Nicaragua and Honduras and there's some logistics to capture everything and to describe everything to the detail that I want to do it uh, sure. in a really kind of geeky way unfortunately you know I want to really because I believe that if you tell these things and you show everything that's going on with cigars people will go wow I can't believe I didn't spend $30 for that thing like I got it for 10 bucks right amazing what right. a deal yeah what a deal you know but if so. you do go to DapperCigars.com, you will find a lot of that content. Yeah. You've done a really good job of making sure that that's at the forefront of yeah. everything that you put out. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, used to be that everything was catalog based in the old days. Now it's website. And uh, I stopped even giving out. We, we used to have this catalog that had all these detailed stories and everything and like, why should we do that? Like, nobody it just ends up in the trash. Put it on the website. Put it on the website. So we just steer everybody to the website, and then we just try to be as descriptive as possible with the scars. Tell, we'll tell every ingredient that we can. And, um, you know, I mean, it's worked out well for us. We need Are the stories but of how you name the cigars on the website? Not yet, but that's part of it as well. Yeah, that's right. another prong. Challenge. Another prong. That's, yeah. Story's important. The, stories the story are important. is important. Yeah. It gets me hooked into... Not only the cigar, but also the guy behind the brand right. or the gal, whoever it is. Right. It really makes me then feel like, wow, I could. Right. You're so passionate about it and you bring so much to it. And it's not just a cigar that you want to make and get out on the market. It's something that you creative, you creatively made. Right. It's kind of like good food, good wine. It's a real high-end process that goes into doing it. Yeah, and... and the other thing that we want to tell more of is the story of the people behind making this products. I'm the one that gets to do the interview, uh, for good or bad, but there's a lot of people behind the scenes that that's their life. It's their, you know, every day they're doing these things that make these products. And so I, we want to, we want to get people into their stories as well because their the, stories are part of our story as well. Do the cigar rollers smoke your cigars? Uh, no, we don't allow them to. We don't. We don't have enough product right now for uh, production. No, they do smoke our cigars. They do. Yeah, yeah they do. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, it's funny because I always ask. You know, there's a guy down there at Knox. His name Boris. Boris is a production manager, um, and Boris, which is a strange name for Nick Robin guy, right? Boris. Right. You would think uh, he's Russian or something, but um, I used to play a joke with him where we walk out in production floor, and I go, "Hey." Uh, I want you to tell me which which uh, which of the supervisors are smoking our cigars, and then he would point them out, and I would go like you know, kind of harass him and just you know tell him how great the cigars was, and then I go, hey, I want you to tell me which ones don't like our cigars. So then we th- that's even better. Yeah. So we just go over there, and I would just you know talk 
talk trash about you know, playfully, you know, tell them they have no taste and that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's real fun. It, it's all in good fun. Right. But, uh, yeah, they do smoke our cigars, and it's important that they do. It's important that guys like Boris are constantly smoking our cigars. Right. Because if there's a problem, they're the first one. They're the canary in the coal mine. So you want them to be smoking the cigars out there, making sure that they're right. You know? Awesome. Yeah. Love it. I think they're shutting us down here. They're shutting us down. This is going to get weird. No, this is perfect. It's mood lighting now. <laughs> We're getting into the, the deep cuts. Yeah. <laughs> the deep cuts. Second take. This is perfect timing for the lights to go down because I do want to end on this really cool story. Once you launch the brand... Sounds like you have a favorite cigar moment. You finally released the Cubo Clara. You gave it to your dad, and you both sat out outside the porch and smoked. What did yeah. that mean to you? Yo, that's, that means everything. You know, uh, my dad didn't smoke nice cigars. He smoked very cheap cigars, um, admittingly. Sure. Um, he smoked affordable cigars. Um, you know, he was, uh, he was a blue-collar person in the military, um, there's, in his life, smoking premium cigars, it had a young family, and, you know, you just couldn't afford it. Sure. But he loved cigars. He smoked them almost every day, uh, usually with a good, good alcohol. Yeah. A moderate amount, of course. Uh, and, um, you know, when I sat there, and we, he smoked Connecticut cigars as well, and when he was smoking that first cigar... I remember him just telling me, this is so much better than what I was smoking. <laughs> that means a lot. That's yeah. a huge one. Yeah. It's cool to have that moment with your dad, especially after making such a big accomplishment. Yeah. Yeah, it means and, the world. It keeps me going. And for him to recognize that. It's, uh, it's really the ultimate form of flattery. It, it really was. That, that meant more. Those moments like that, not that there's anything better than that, but if I make a good cigar... And I give that to a friend, and they genuinely enjoy it. it you get a lot of satisfaction from that. It keeps you going. But that's, that's awesome. the ultimate one, yeah. Keep it going, Ian. You're making <laughs> great it. cigars. We appreciate it. We were smoking the... Desvalido. Desvalido. Yeah. During this now medium-bodied or... Medium-full. A little medium bit more full? on the fuller side, yeah. Really well-balanced. A lot of... Should be well-balanced. So enjoyable. good. Yeah, glad you like it. Thank you all for watching another episode of Box Press. Ian, thank you for being on. I appreciate you so much. Get out and try Dapper Cigar Company's, uh, everything that they have to offer, dappercigarcompany.com. If you need anything as far as keeping those cigars fresh, head over to Bovet Inc. And if you enjoyed this, go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe because we're trying to bring more and more conversations with makers like Ian to your doorstep. And we appreciate you. Thank you all. Have a great night.